first, uh, second Samuel, before I say anything, I want you, if you have your Bible, open with me to second Samuel chapter 9, uh, from verse 1, I believe, to 9, and there's one on the wall there, and, uh, and David said, is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him to David, David said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, Your servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, is in the house of Micah, the son of Amir, in Lord Deborah. Then the king, then King David said, and brought him out of the house of Mekel, the son of Amir from Lodeber, when Meshiboshet, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Meshiboshet, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and I will restore you all the land of Saul. Now keep watching that, the land of Saul, not Jonathan. The land of Saul your father, and you shall eat bread at my table. And he bowed himself and said, What is your behold? And said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? And the king called to Ziba, saw servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. May the Lord bless his word this morning in Jesus' name. I want to look at this scripture, this story this morning in, the, uh, in relation to this special day called Thanksgiving. And I give you just a little a bit of um, a background here. Uh, David, for those of us who are a little bit familiar with the Bible story, you know the story of David and Saul, the conflict that persisted for years. And David was a broken, battered young man emotionally and otherwise. And, and from, through some divine providence, the Lord brought him and Saul together and Saul was, as it were, was supposed to become his adopted father or, or godfather, whatever you want to call him, or a mentor. But because of Saul's insecurity himself, is a dangerous thing to be mentored by a broken man or woman. They do more damage to you and me. <laughs> Then good, amen. But that's not what we want to go into this morning. And here he was. Uh, so David suffered an untold persecution in the hand of King Saul, like we all know. But a time came as we fast forward this story, and suddenly heaven remembered David, and the kingdom now was handed over to him, and that should be a time of rejoicing and celebrating, and, and David, like every other person, if I was him, I would say, oh, at last, my time of rest has come. The kingdom has been given over to me. It is time for me even possibly to take vengeance on all my enemies or eat and just enjoy with my family, and now because God has remembered us. But not so with David. In the midst of victory, restoration, and power, prosperity, if you like, David perks and remembered somebody that could be in need. 
To me, that is thanksgiving. <coughs> he puts. He didn't get carried away with his new status. He didn't get carried away with the new position that God has entrusted to him. In the midst of plenty, David still remembered. And he said, Meshiboshet, as it were, did not come looking for David, for help. He didn't come looking for Handa. It wasn't him that came knocking on the door of the palace and said, I was once a priest. I once lived in this house. It, can you please be kind enough to me? Can you give me? I've not eaten for three days. Uh, I've been homeless for the last three weeks. Uh, he didn't walk into the church looking for help. In a way, David went looking for who to help. I think that is, should be the story of the church. He went out looking for who to help. He went out looking for this one. He said, is there any left in the house of Saul, my arch enemy, that I've been sure He didn't even ask anybody. In the house of Saul. Why Saul? The one who had abused him. The one who betrayed him. The one who let him down. The one that it would be justified if he took vengeance on the house of Saul. But it was that same house that he first of all wanted to show kindness to on a Thanksgiving day. He wanted to be kind. Thanksgiving is two words put together. Thanks and given. You cannot give thanks without the given. Amen. Amen. You cannot give thanks without given. So when I am thankful on one hand, and on the other hand, I'm extending the generosity of God to those who need it most around me. As I think about today, I think about the word thanksgiving and the word forgiven or forgiveness. Same thing. That is why forgiveness is a gift that we give to those who are undeserving. You give the gift of forgiveness to those who do not deserve it. You don't give the gift because it is a time to reach out with a gratitude, a heart full of gratitude and say, Lord, you've been so good for me. You rescued me when I should have died yesterday. You showed me mercy. When everybody turned their back on me, you've got my back. Now I am standing tall and I know there are people who are still in the same gutter, in the same pit of sin and deprivation like I am. The Bible says, woe is he that is at ease in Zion. God did not rescue you and me to just sit down and enjoy our morning service, wood worship song every Sunday morning. He saved us so that we can go out there and look for the Meshibosheth of our community and our generation, if you like. Look at how twisted and broken the name is. That name also speaks to his own dysfunctionality. And you know the story of Meshibosheth. He found himself in that pit, not from his own choice or bad mistake that he made. The Bible, the story went to say about Meshibosheth, when the auntie or the servant, when she heard that the father had died and, and both the father and the grandfather died on the same day, he picked the child and was trying to run with him and she dropped him. <coughs> And suddenly he became crippled. He wasn't born a cripple. Something happened, an accident happened along the way that changed the story of that young man. He was once a priest or a priest with God. A, a royal fee. He grew up, he was born into royalty. But life dealt a terrible blow on him. 
Is it possible then that the people we meet on the street every day and the people and the people sitting next to us that we have prejudged them and condemned based on what we know about them today, that there is more to their story than meets the eye? Would we stop and pause a little bit like David today and say, is there any in the house of Saul? The one that was brought to David was the broken and the battered one in the house of Saul. Not the one that stands his foot five tall, looking tall and handsome with a blonde hair. The one that was condemned to a place of silence called Low Devon. A place of dryness, a place of emptiness. That was the one that was remembered by heaven through David. God is saying to you and to me on this Thanksgiving day, there is one in low devil, there is a Meshibosheth near you, your neighbor, looking and saying, where will heaven? Heaven has remembered them. We are the extension of God's kingdom on earth here. Because forgiveness is an expression, <clears throat> a physical expression of thankfulness. That was what David was expressing. He was being thankful to God by forgiving the son of his enemy. When you forgive, you were showing gratitude to God. Jesus speaking, he said, if you do not forgive those who are trespass against you, your heavenly father would not forgive you. And so man, the act of forgiveness is a physical expression of thankfulness to God. I said, God, you've been so good to me. I was not worthy of this grace and mercy that you have shown me. So I am willing, in my attitude of gratefulness, I will extend that to the one who has hurt me, who has broken me, who has betrayed me, who has let me down. Jesus had this to say in Matthew chapter 18, verse 33, about a servant who refused to forgive he was forgiven, but he refused to forgive. David knew that he was not sitting on that throne because he was a smart young man. It was the mercy and the grace of God. And so he showed that mercy. Jesus speaking, he said, Shouldn't you also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I have compassion on you? Thanksgiving is a reminder calling us to a place of forgiveness. Why do we forgive? Because a thankful and a grateful heart knows that he is nothing without God. I didn't get here by myself. It's not my good works that get me, got me here. My marriage is not held together because I'm such a good woman or I'm such a loving husband. It is the mercy of God. So before you look down on that woman whose marriage is in crisis right now, take a look at yourself and say, it is the mercy of God He showed me. You don't have all the money that you have today because you know how to plan and budget your finances very well. It is the mercy of God. So before you look down your nose on somebody else and look down your nose on your brother or your sister and say, they are where they are because they made the wrong choice. Yes, that could be true, but there is more to their story than what you can see or know. Learn to look beyond the facial and the physical. What you see may not be what it is right now. Because a thankful heart knows that God has been merciful to them and they will show mercy irregardless of that situation or circumstances. Jesus said, I am the vine. He said, without me you can do nothing. Without me you are nothing. John 15 verse 5. Without him, you and I, we are nothing. And so to me, Thanksgiving today is more than having turkey and mashed potato and gravy and what else do you guys have today? Corn, stuffing, process cross, whatever that is. Amen. 
and my, my boys have been on my head all and so over when they don't have Thanksgiving thing, they want stuffing, they want uh, uh, cranberry pie. stuff and pumpkin pie. pie and all the whole nine yard. You know what I mean? So if that is all that Thanksgiving is all about, then we are of all men most miserable, as wonderful as that is, as wonderful as that treble is going to be spread in our home today, as we rejoice with our brothers and our sisters and our spouse, can we take a pause a little bit and say, it's more than, a, it's, it, it, it's, it's more than what we're saying. Thanksgiving is an attitude. Thanksgiving is an action word. It has a lot to do with our actions and, and our attitude, our disposition. Not just saying thank you. You know what I mean? We are thankful to God. What I mean by that is that, you see, that there is a way I will relate to you as a child of God that will show that I'm thankful to the Lord for your life and my life. I'm not going to treat you like church. I'm not going to treat you based on your past. I'm not going to treat you based on what I think I know about you that may not even be true. I'm not going to treat you based on my own personal prejudice and, and my preconceived idea of what I think, or who you think and who I believe you are. I'm not going to treat you because you're too poor and I'm better dressed than you are. You know what I mean? No, this is the truth, right? I'm not going to treat you that way. I'm not being thankful to God for what he's done for me. If I begin to come to you and talk down at you and look down my nose at you because I believe that my state socially is better than you, I'm not being thankful to God. If I begin to look down on you because I think that I'm more spiritual than you are, then there is something wrong because I believe that I have attained what I've attained in life by my own strength. So I glory in my flesh. So thanksgiving is more than just mere words. It has to do with our attitude and our actions and disposition in relation to our brothers and sisters. Because your attitude determines your altitude, generally anyway. We agree on that. But the Bible says, well, whatever you do, in words or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3, 7, 10. Giving thanks to the Father. And so, giving thanks to the Father will resonate from the way I conduct my life in relations to my brothers and my sisters. And only a humble, a broken heart can be grateful to God. Do you know that? Only a broken, contrite heart can be grateful, can be thankful. And I'm learning not to grumble, not to complain all the time. But it's not an easy road to <laughs> Jesus and I'm saying. As I was thinking about it this morning, I said, Lord, I'm not going to complain about my small teaching anymore. <laughs> I'm going to be grateful for that. I'm going to be thankful. Be humble and say, Lord, I thank you. It's not easy, but I think we can learn to do that. There's something about David that is so profound. I remember this scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18. And when God began to speak to David, listen to David. This is, you see, David's reaction and response to the house of Saul was not an impromptu thing. It was imbued. It was built. That's why God said, he the man after my own heart. Yes, he had weaknesses, he had flaws, but there was something that uh, the compassionate heart of David was in bad because he knew that where he is in life was all by the grace and the mercy of God. David was not an entitled person. You know, have you met people who feel very entitled? They believe the world owes them. Amen. You owe them. You owe them. 
you know what I mean? We feel so entitled sometimes. David was not so. David said, who am I? And what is my father's house? The humble house. That God would look out for me and show me so mercy and kindness. And I remember years ago in Sweden and the same spirit and grace resonated in my spirit. Uh, there's this man and a very prominent man in Scandinavia. And one afternoon we were in the church and he came, was old enough to be my granddad. I know that. But he came to me and God was working something inside of me. And I've been asking the Lord, I said, Lord, what have I done in my short life to deserve all that you're doing in my life? And I didn't get an answer right away. And when this man came, and he knelt in front of me, and in a, a whole church, I'm talking about a big church, and he knelt there, and he said, John, pray for me. My heart broke. And I said, Lord, who am I? What am I? Why should you be so gracious and kind to me? I didn't feel so important or more anointed because I'm a Pentecostal pastor, I can speak in tongues and I prophesy. No. It has to show the mercy and the humility of God and the Holy Spirit began to say, listen, you are just a beneficiary of somebody's seed. I said, oh, and he said, you are reaping what your mother sold and never got any part of it before she died. I want to talk to you, God willing, if the Lord tires, God willing next Sunday about the power of seed. It's not money we're talking about now. Whatever you sow, that will you reap. And when the Lord said to me, you are just a beneficiary of somebody else's kindness and goodness and seeds. He said, you're just reaping what your mother sowed. It has nothing to do with you. That humbled me the more. That I know that I'm not what I am or where I am in life. My state in life has nothing to do because I prayed or because I can fast or because I can read the Bible or I can quote some scriptures. No. It has everything to do with the mercy and the grace of God. And that keeps you humble. So you don't walk with your shoulder high and think you're better than everybody else. It just pleased God to pick you and be kind to you. He picked you so that you can pick somebody else. Mm -hmm. He raised you so that you can raise anyone that he brings into your life. Anybody that crosses your path, whether you're a housewife, a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a hairdresser, whatever you are, whatever God has given you as a gift, is not for you to use to oppress or to become arrogant. It is for you to reach out to the Meshibosheth in your community. Because a thankful heart is always a giving heart. He said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefit unto me? David was always thinking about that. Because giving thanks is about extending grace that we have received. Extending the same gift that we have received from God to others. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 15 says, for it is, all, it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, your grace should extend, your grace of giving, of showing love, forgiveness and compassion Giving thanks is about the gift of becoming a beautiful and love that. Giving 
tags is about the gifted you that have been gifted so much, becoming the expression of God's hand on earth here. That is what it means to be thankful. And giving thanks is about the gift of becoming an extension of heaven on earth here. And finally, this morning, as we pray, we give thanks to demonstrate the true heart of Christ in us by offering forgiveness to the undeserving, like we say. And giving thanks also when we live in an attitude of praise and thankfulness and gratitude before our children, we are teaching our children also a wonderful attitude and legacy so that they don't feel so entitled. We are raising a generation of entitled men and women in this world today. You know that this generation feels so entitled for doing nothing. They believe the world owes them something for nothing. But when we begin to show a heart of gratitude to God for every little thing, for the cup of water, when I pray with my children, I start by praying for the roof and thanking God for the roof over our head, for the clothes on our back, the food on our table, every day, because I know that every day is a gift from God. I'm not going to take that for granted. They need to know that. So as we celebrate the goodness of God today, I still think about what God has done for you. Jesus speaking in Matthew and Luke chapter 7, verse 47, he said something about this woman who demonstrated a heart that is beyond understanding. People were complaining about her reckless love and abundance to God. And Jesus said, this woman loved much because she had what? Been forgiven much. A loving heart. And as I read the scripture and as I was praying and meditating on it, the Holy Spirit just put a word in my heart and said, <coughs> a forgiving heart is a loving heart. And a loving heart is a giving heart. A forgiving heart is a loving heart. And a loving heart is a giving heart. You will give. Because we are stingy, because when we say give, you think they're talking about money. And I began to think about it for prayer. Time. And I said, Lord, I want to be a giver. And he said, give. And I give. I give my time. I don't have, I wish I had money. I pray all this stuff to be a millionaire or something. I don't know how that's going to happen in this lifetime. Amen. But I, but I realized something that I give wherever I go. Now, I, was, I, I, I traveled uh, last weekend and I was hosted by a family. I didn't have anything to give. And before I think of, you don't have anything to give, I know it was a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I knew I have so much to give. I have my prayers to give to them. I have my smile to give. And I have my ability to cook. <laughs> right? I, I, I have that. It's a gift that I need to keep giving. And so I, I'm not going to go with my high horses and think I'm too big. Now, oh, I'm in this place, I'm a pastor, I need to act the part. The act, the part is the act of giving. Giving of yourself. And so don't ever let the enemy deceive you into thinking that you have nothing to give. You have something to give. Today's Thanksgiving, you have a phone call to give. You can call somebody today and say, how are you doing? It's not about money. Money is the least when God talks about you in relation.
forgiven. David says, is there any in the house of Saul? As we pray this morning, is there any in your life that you believe that God will want you to remember and be thankful to God for your life and show kindness to Is there somebody today that you can think of it may be 10,000 miles away. It does not matter. If there's somebody today on this special day of Thanksgiving, before we eat our turkey, or when we're done eating it, and before we take the down and begin to snooze on the sofa, is there somebody that you can think about and say, is there any? How desperate? How can someone be so desperate to show kindness? I've never seen that before, only in David. We want to avoid responsibility. If nobody can notice it, we can go away with it. We want to keep as much as we have, right? We don't want to give up. We want to save for retirement. We want to keep money away. We want to, but David was so desperate. He said, is there any? Do I think something wrong with you? If there's nobody, why don't you just enjoy your life and just keep on going? But he went looking for. And God is saying, reach out to somebody today on this special day of Thanksgiving and say, is there anyone left in the house of my ex-husband, my ex-wife, my teacher, my neighbor, my brother that was not spoken to, my mother-in-law, That is the name that the fear of mother in law is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> well, I have a good mother in law, though, so I can't complain. Amen. <laughs> yeah, she's a wonderful woman. But think about people your mother in law, your father in law, your uncle. On the more seriousness this morning, David was not looking for his friends to exhort, to alleviate. He was not looking for his palace, those who have been good to him. He was not looking out to reward those who have stood by him faithfully. He was not looking out for those who treated him well while he was in the pit. He was not looking for all the 40 men and those 30 strong men that stood by him, fought for him, and fought through. I would think that that is the first person you should think about. We stood with you, we fought with you. How dare you now you're thinking about this man after all we have done for you. But David had a different heart. He was doing good to those who cannot pay him back. Shall we stand up this morning? <coughs> As the worship thing comes, what a song that they have. I want you, as as we sing the song, I don't know what song they have to sing, but as we worship this morning with a heart of gratitude in you, that spirit of gratitude we're talking about this morning, I want it to be a time of reflection. Your life is good right now. Forget about what is not. Your life is good. You standing before me this morning, your life is better than somebody else's right now. Do you agree to that? Yes. You are better than somebody right now. You are not in the bottom line of life. One, you are not homeless. If you don't have a job, you have a roof over your head. If your marriage is not working, at least you are married. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So that means you're better than the one who, who doesn't have a husband. And there's somebody who said, I wish I could even have a drunken husband. So let it be said, I had a married <coughs> wife. To you who is worried about your children, there is a woman who is barring somewhere and said, Lord, I don't even care. Give me a son and let him be a thief, but let I, so that people will call me a mother for once in my life. 
So you started here this morning. You're better. It's not all bad. What am I saying? So you can be good to somebody. Don't let the enemy deceive you into thinking that your life is worse than anybody else's. Yes, it could be better, and it will get better, and it can be better, and it should be better. But while we are waiting for that great improvement, let us begin to be thankful for what God is done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Just uh, for us to worship God and just begin to be thankful to God. That's all our prayers this afternoon. Mm -hmm.